Immanuel Kant, Critic of Practical Reason, a work on ethics, uh, first published 1788, the principal ideas of which are that morality can claim objectivity and universality only by being founded on pure reason in itself. Moral laws are universal and categorical because of their form, not their empirical content. The fundamental law of the pure practical reason is so to act that the maxim of the will could always function as a principle establishing universal laws. Were it not for the moral law, man could never know himself, or woman could never know herself, to be free for man and woman thou art implies thou canst. The rational postulates of the practical reason are that man and woman is free, that the soul is immortal, and that God exists. None of Kant's writings can be understood without a clear recognition of the Copernican revolution in philosophy affected by his first critic, the Critic of Pure Reason of 1781. Previously, the predominant rational tradition in Western philosophy was founded on the assumption of reason's capacity for discovering the forms or essential structures characterizing all things. Whether the form of treeness was an innate aspect of every existent tree, as Aristotle believed, or a transcendent form in which each existent tree participated, as Plato held. The capacity of reason for perceiving such forms was not doubted. The medieval controversy over universals centred not in reason's ability for such perception, but in the nature of this rational activity. From the first questioning of the nominalists, however, through the break between self and the exterior world in Descartes, doubt as to the precise authority of rational apprehension increased. Human error and empirical deception began to be seen as intervening between perceiver and perceived, thus raising uh, powerfully the question of the criteria for truth. The Aristotelians, especially from the time of St. Thomas Aquinas onwards, affirmed that knowledge begins with sense perception. However, because of reason's capacity for extracting forms, human knowledge possessed not only the qualities of necessity and universality, but made possible an inductive knowledge of trans-empirical realities. It was the empiricists, especially David Hume, who provided the most serious challenge to this rationalist claim. Centering his attack on the problem of universal causality, cause and effect as universally operative, Hume raised the question of necessity. On what grounds, he asked, can one insist that the necessity, that all effects have causes, and similarly that such causes necessarily produce identical, identical effects? Hume's conclusion was that the category of causality, like all human ideas, is derived from sense impressions. Having the status simply of a habitual assumption and expectation, human ideas are forever bereft of necessity. It was Kant who saw the seriousness of this empiricist challenge. Reason was bankrupt as an agent of knowledge if it could no longer claim necessity and thus universality for its findings. Man and the world had been severed, and scepticism seemed the inevitable result. The answer provided by Kant's first critique was a revolution, a complete reversal of the previous conception of the knowing process. If human knowledge cannot claim a necessity, which is resident within the empirical world itself, it is possible, nevertheless, to claim universality for it, if the locus of necessity is within the universal operation of human reason, 
With this new conception of rational necessity and universality, Kant proceeded to exhibit what he conceived to be the necessary operations of rational apprehension, the manner in which the understanding by its very structure has, and of necessity, will always perceive and organize whatever realities encounter it. As Kant interpreted it, interpreted it Hume's error was in seeing subjective necessity as grounded only in habit, instead of uh, being a result of the a priori structure of reason. If the latter is the case, rational necessity and universality are guaranteed, although on a far different basis from before. For Kant, the forms perceived through sensed experience are the product of the categories of the human mind. But now the externality so encountered is never known as it is in itself as noumenon, but only in relation to man as phenomenon. While reason attempts to complete this knowledge by bringing it into a comprehensive unity, it is barred from success in this speculative operation by certain antinomies, antinomies, I hate these words, both sides of which are in harmony with man's phenomenal knowledge. In the area of speculative psychology, these antinomies make it possible to affirm a soul existing apart from the physical. In the area of speculative cosmology, the consequences of the antinomies set this in the impossibility of establishing man as free of the determined process of cause and effect, and in the area of speculative theology, the antinomies negate the possibility of proving the existence of God. In all cases, the antinomies defy resolution of these questions either positive, positive, positively or negatively. As a result, Reason, in its theoretical function, is barred from any cognitive penetration into the noumenal. This does not mean that the noumenal realm is necessarily unlike man's phenomenal knowledge of it, and that human categories do not apply there. Rather, the problem is that pure reason can provide no guarantee of any correspondence. What is most significant about the first critique is that while Kant revives the old platonic distinction between noumenon and phenomenon, in exploring reason along the narrowly Aristotelian lines of his day as a strictly cognitive activity, the platonic distinction between a severe human limitation, Plato had stressed the noetic aspects of reason which was deeply imbued with a intuitive or mystical quality. But in the preface to the second edition of the first critique, Kant gave indication that he was moving toward a broader or more platonic conception of reason. And I quote, I have found it necessary to deny knowledge, that's of uh, supersensible super sensible reality, in order to make room for faith. End quote. Although faith for Kant was to be understood largely in moral terms, stemming from his pietistic background, we have here a beginning indication of his recognition of modes of human apprehension far broader than simply discursive or cognitive reason. Much of the impetus for exploring this possibility came from Kant's tremendous interest in ethics, made urgent by the seemingly undermining effect of his first critique upon this realm. His understanding of the experience of the form of duty, like Plato's experience of the form of the good, has about it the near-mystical quality. A near-mystical quality. The crack... The... The critique of practical reason 
is of major importance not only as the attempt to create a purely rational ethic, but also as a defense of a non-discursive mode of apprehension as an insistence that the rational is not restricted in meaning to the cognitive. It is this point which Kant develops further in the third critique, the critique of judgment of 1790. In terms of beauty and the purposiveness of nature, that's in the critique of judgment, it covers that. In order to understand these points, however, one must beware of the misleading title of the second critique. In distinguishing between pure reason and practical reason, Kant is not speaking of two human agents or loci of activity. In both critiques he is speaking of pure reason as such, but in the first he is concerned with its theoretical or speculative function, in the second with its practical or ethical function. For Kant this second function is the activity known as will. It is purpose to show that will is not divorced from reason, controlled internally by drives or impulses, or externally by pleasure stimuli. In its fulfilled operation it is a purely rational enterprise. It is pure reason in its practical operation which must control drives and determine external ends. Likewise in this realm it was Hume who haunted Kant, for Hume understood reason as being the pawn, uh, that's P-O, that's, no, <laughs> P-A-W-N, Hume understood reason as being the pawn of, pos of passions and morality as being rooted in subjective feeling. Just as Kant's answer in the cognitive realm depended on exhibiting the a priori or categor categorical laws of man's cognitive activity, so his answer in the second critique depended on discovering the a priori or categorical laws of the rational will. Morality could claim objectivity and universality only by being founded not on experience but on pure reason itself. The task of the second critique, then, is to discover the a priori or necessary principles of the practical reason. At the heart of the problem of ethics is the problem of freedom without freedom. Morality is an impo impossibility. But according to the first critique, since all things are seen of necessity, under the category of causality, all things are seen as determined. Yet Kant insists the same noumenon phenomenon, distinction, applying to the object of such knowledge, also applies to the subject as well. It is man who, as phenomenon, who is seen under the category of necessity, but the nature of the noumenal man remains unknown. Although the speculative function of reason strives for an understanding of the human soul, the antinomies, as we have, have as, the antinomies, as I've explained, left the matter of freedom for the noumenal self as problematic but not impossible. If Kant can exhibit the will as free, he believes he can also show the capacity of pure reason to determine the will's total activity. If there is to be an objective ethic, an ethic based on freedom, the only possibility for it can be uh, reason presupposing nothing else but itself. For a rule can be objective and universal only if it is not subject to any contingent subjective conditions. Thus, moral laws cannot be based on the pleasure principle for the objects of pleasure and pain can only be identified empirically, thus having no objective necessity. Further, hedonism can make no legitimate distinction between higher and lower pleasures, and if reason is able to determine the will, can there be a higher faculty of desire than base feelings? 
Likewise, there is no objective universal basis for an ethic of happiness, for happiness is simply the general name for satisfaction of desire, which is probably why I'm not very happy. Anyway, I shall end there for now and continue this in the next video. Thank you for listening.